<laughs> morning. 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 How's everybody? Good, good. Awesome. You know, I have to say, much, much more even distribution <laughs> on both sides this week. Well done. I like some of you who made the jump from this side to this side. It makes me feel, well, it makes me feel like we're not going to tip over. So I appreciate you being nice and evenly distributed. <laughs> and some of you are here thinking, what a nerd. <laughs> and we, we are what we are. Well, it's week eight. Uh, this marks our eighth week uh, in uh, Paul's letter to the Ephesians, or more appropriately, to his letter to the believers in southwest Turkey, otherwise known as Asia Minor. You can see a map of it up here. Um, Ephesus, Colossa, uh, Lystra, Iconium, Antioch, uh, all of these are churches that Paul was writing to uh, in this letter. And his means of a brief recap, uh, trying to make it briefer and briefer, is that not correct grammar, is it? More and more brief. Right? Yeah. More and more brief uh, every week. Um, this is a letter that Paul was writing about Christian identity to, uh, to the believers in these churches in Asia Minor. Uh, he's told them many things. Things like they are adopted sons and daughters of God. Uh, that they have been marked with the seal of God's Holy Spirit, guaranteeing the authenticity of their adoption. Okay, this is who they are. This is their identity. This is the way uh, they identify themselves in relation to the world. He's told them that they have been raised from death to life with Christ. He says, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, but God, who is rich in mercy, made you alive with Christ. For no other reason than that he loves us. He said you are God's workmanship. You are God's masterpiece created to do good works in Christ. He said you are one with all of God's people without exception. God doesn't have a, kind of a rankings of believers. God doesn't favor one group of believers over another group of believers. He said you are all one with all of God's people without exception. And together, Paul said, God is building his church with all of the believers upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. And he has said that together with all of the believers in the world, we are a testimony proclaiming the glory of God to the whole world through the unity of all the believers. And that God has given gifts to every believer to be used for the glory of God, for the building up of his church, and for the building up of one another. So that's, that's where we left off last week. And of course, last week, the chapter 4 began with Paul's first real command of the letter. Remember what the command was? The first real command of the letter, he said, As a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you received. And he adds more to that this week. Verse 17, chapter 4. He said, So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord. That's more strong, sort of imperative language, right? more commanding type language. I insist on it. Last week he urged, this week he insists on it in the Lord. He attaches that phrase in the Lord for added weight. It's not just Paul saying this. In the Lord, I'm telling you this. It's as though it's from the Lord himself. I insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. Now, this is where we kind of bring everything to a screeching halt. Isn't Paul writing to a church full of Gentiles? I mean, this is not a, a southwestern Turkey. is not a stronghold of uh, Jewish Christians. These are Gentiles Paul's writing to. But it's as if uh, Paul is using this term to identify them with God's people. Remember how he said, you were dead in your sins and transgressions, but God made you alive in Christ. You used to be outside the family of God, but now God has chosen you. He's predestined you to be adopted as God's own sons and daughters. He's using this term, Gentiles, to distinguish them 
as God's chosen people, separating them from those around them who are still living outside the family of God, who live in a culture that ascribes to a certain lifestyle that's not compatible with the values of God or the kingdom. Right? So I urge you, insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. This word futility, kind of a powerful way to think about it, isn't it? Futility can also be translated as meaningless. And the word is actually used just one or two times in all of the New Testament. But you know where it turns up a lot? In the Greek translation of the Old Testament known as the Septuagint. And there's one place in the Septuagint, the Greek <laughs> translation of the Old Testament, where it appears over and over and over again. Now we're going to have uh, Ecclesiastes on the board here. Ecclesiastes is a book in the Bible presumed to be written by Solomon, the son of David. In fact, that's the very first verse in the very first chapter of Ecclesiastes. The words of the teacher, the son of David, King Jerusalem. Sounds a lot like Solomon. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What does man gain from all his labor at which he toils under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and it hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place the streams come from, there they return again. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear its fill of hearing. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything in which one can say, look, there is something new. It was here already long ago. It was here before our time. There is no remembrance of men of old, and even those who are yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow so if that doesn't perk up your day, <laughs> nothing will, right? Yeah. It's this meaninglessness in their thinking, Paul says, this futility in their thinking. They're darkened in their understanding, separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. It's not a problem of sin or behavior, Paul says. It's a futility and problem of the mind and of the heart. Futility of the mind is, is this disconnect, is this error in thinking, Paul says, leads to a disconnect between people and their creator. And everything flows from that futility of thinking, that lack of understanding, that thinking error in the mind. They're darkened in their understanding. In the ancient world, uh, in the ancient world, light was synonymous with understanding. If you were walking in the light, you were enlightened. You understood. If you were walking in darkness or living in darkness, you kind of in, in a fog, kind of clueless. You were ignorant in your understanding. And of course, in the Bible, uh, light is used to define life with God. You know. He says the Gentiles are living in darkness because they are without the life of God. They are separate from God who is the source of life and the source of understanding. So the Gentiles are even willfully ignorant uh, due to this futility of their thinking. That they refuse to acknowledge God and therefore their hearts are hardened. And now maybe we understand a little bit better this prayer Paul prayed in chapter 3. Essentially, he's praying that their eyes would be opened, that they would know the love of God so that they would be enlightened, so their hearts would not be hard like their neighbors are. 
that they would be open to understanding, that they would see the world more clearly for what it really is and, and know the truth that is in Jesus. He goes on, verse 19, Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. Now, if you're, if you're following along, what's this book say? Can we go back to verse 19? But some of them, uh, yeah, some of them says, uh, and they are full of greed. Uh, my, my Bible says, with a continual lust for more. Yeah, both kind of mean the same thing. Uh, the Gentiles have lost their way due to their willful ignorance, their hardness of heart, and therefore they've given themselves over to whatever feels right, to whatever seems to be okay, even if it leads to nowhere. And one commentator uh, said it really well. He said, with one single word, futility, Paul describes the majority of of the inhabitants of the Greco-Roman Empire as aiming with silly methods at a meaningless goal. Essentially what Paul's saying is it's not, it's not the method that's really truly the problem. It's not all these behaviors acting out. It's not the pursuit of sensuality in and of itself. It's what you're ultimately pursuing. It's not the method. It's the goal. They're darkening their understanding. They're, they're experiencing a hardness of the heart. And so they're ultimately pursuing something that leads nowhere. And they're using methods may or may not be ultimately destructive and harmful in and of themselves, but they're using methods to reach a goal that ultimately goes nowhere. The darkness of their thinking, the hardness of their hearts, that lead the Gentiles to continually pursue meaning in things that are meaningless and continually want more and more. And both the Jews and the Christians ultimately understood this as idolatry. Right? And idolatry being the root of all sin. Impure activity of any kind, Paul would say, has its ultimate root in greedy desire. Sin is not a function of behavior. Sin is much more than just the action. It, it is a, a condition of the mind and of the heart. He goes on. You, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Doesn't that sound a little bit like a scolding parent? Is that the way I taught you? Is that the way you were raised? And your translation might also say, that, however, is not, yeah, there it is. That, however, is not the way of life that you learn. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. Paul says there, there's, there's a very clear line here between what you were taught by me, what I shared with you about Jesus, and what you know in the world. When you were taught about Christ, he says, your lives were illuminated. The, the light came on, and for the first time, maybe you really saw the truth. And you were led into the light and out of the darkness in order to see your way for the first time. You were taught, Paul says, with regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. It, it, it's really graphic imagery. I think it's something we can all relate to. You were told to put off like you would take off a, a jacket or a coat. You were taught to take off that old way of life. To take it off and leave it to the side. Very, very similar here um, to other scriptures where Paul uh, tells his listeners that they have died with Christ or died to sin. Um, this way of life is the old way. Characterized by 
chaos, separation from God, darkness and lack of understanding, hardness of heart, and ignorance. Yeah. A lot of this section reminds me a lot of Romans 12. Just to read that really quickly. Paul writes in Romans 12, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and prove what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. The, it adds a little bit more authenticity to this, doesn't it? That, that Paul sounds kind of the same and says sort of the same things in so many different letters. I think if we were to hear Paul say really dramatically different things, we'd kind of wonder if really it was Paul that wrote all these different letters. But it adds a little bit of credibility if he's fairly consistent in what he's saying. In Romans, he tells them to do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of their minds. Here he says <coughs> to be made new in the attitude of your minds, to put on the new self. In the former self, I think Paul would say, was, was suited, fitted for idolatry and sin. The new self is fitted for, for the way you are to be now, this righteousness and holiness. I mean, we can even think of it as a, as a reinforcement of Ephesians 2.10. You are God's workmanship, created for good works in Christ. Righteousness and holiness, these things sort of have their beginning, their, their genesis, their source in Jesus with the sin and ignorance having their source in, in the world. As Paul said earlier in the letter, the ruler of the kingdom of the air. There's a, a, a lot of content in, in really a relatively short section of this letter. But the message is very, very clear. Uh, you are to live a life worthy of the calling that you receive. You must no longer live as you used to live in this futility of thinking, this lack of understanding and clarity regarding the world. We focus on the, the putting off of the old way, the putting on of the new way, and, and really the, the, the clarity of thought, the critical thinking that Paul encourages them to. Now that's clearly the intent of this letter is, is for the believers here to really truly engage in, in critical thought, <clears throat> to be clear thinkers when it comes to who they are and their place in the world. And to really clearly see the world for what it is and, and see the difference between the way of God and the way of the world. He challenges them to, to really look at the world with eyes wide open and to see it for what it is. And to live differently. We are not informed and we are not led by the whims of the culture. Paul says you are to be led by the gospel and the, the teachings of Christ and the example of Christ. And yet, that's sort of the tension that we all live with, isn't it? We live with this constant tension between, as Paul would say, knowing what I am supposed to do and yet doing the things I know that I'm not supposed to do. Why, why Paul says, do I feel this tension, this struggle? I, why do I do the thing I know I should not do, and why do I not do the thing that I know I should do? Amen. You know, that's the same struggle we all have. I, I know what I'm supposed to be about, and I, I can look on the things of this world, and I know that ultimately I don't find my, my wholeness, my peace in these things. But, man, are they ever sparkly and pretty and shiny? Or maybe it's just the attitude that we, we find ourselves returning to. Right? We find ourselves living according to the way of the world. We discriminate. We objectify. And ultimately justify these 
thoughts, these attitudes, by the world standards. Well, and I might be a little bit discriminating, but at least I'm not as bad as somebody else. The, the constant challenge we live with, day in and day out, is to really clearly see things as they truly are. To be enlightened by the Gospels. To be enlightened by the teaching of Jesus. To be enlightened by the Holy Spirit. And to resist the pull of the world so that we can really think and live different. Now, this, this mantra, do not be conformed, uh, should, should be something that is burned into our psyche, or this, this mantra to put off the old way should be burned into our psyche every morning when we get up. From the moment we wake up in the morning to the moment we go to bed at night. And, and, and it should be our, our aim, our goal, to truly become students of Christ. To daily, to daily seek to, to learn more and more and more and more. Because that's the, the second part of uh, Paul's command in Romans. Be transformed by the renewing of their minds and here in, the, in Ephesians. <clears throat> to be made new in the attitude of your minds. We're building and if we're really looking to, to, to become more like Jesus in our in our actions. Well, it really starts in the mind. Because somebody once said, if you want to act like Jesus, you first have to think like Jesus. The first order of business is to become students of Jesus. If we're to be critical thinkers, if we're to really see the world clearly for what it is, understanding who we are, in the world, well, we have to continually commit ourselves to being made new in the attitude of our minds. Uh, it, it, you know, in so many things, I, um, there was an article in the paper uh, uh, yesterday, I believe, about uh, the kicker for the ducks. Uh, all I have to say is kicker for the ducks. And you're like, oh, no. We don't mind if he's coming out to kick an extra point, do we? He's pretty good at making those. Um, it's an article about uh, the kicker for the ducks and how hard he is on himself when he misses. Now, I, I, have, I have a friend who uh, used to be a kicker for the ducks, and he would say, it's all, it's all in the head. It's all between the ears. You can make them nine times out of ten in practice, but something happens when you step onto the field, the score tied late in the game or down three late in the game, uh, 60,000 people in the stands, and somebody actually trying to keep you from kicking it? And just like that, the, the, the battle we fight, day in and day out, is, is one and lost between our ears. We have to be committed to the renewing of our minds, to the attitude of our minds and being made new there. If somebody uh, asked me once, you know, I, I'm fairly new, I haven't really been a Christian very long, and, and I've been reading my Bible, but, uh, you know, I started at the beginning, that's really confusing. Um, where, should I, where should I be reading? And I, I tell anybody who, who wants to know sort of where they should start in their Bible, you start, start with Jesus. That's where we start from. We, we start with Jesus. That's the foundation of our understanding of everything that we are to know about God. Start with Jesus. Start in the Gospel of Mark. It's the shortest, most compact, most kind of action-packed. I think it's one of the funnest Gospels. Start with Mark. And maybe graduate from Mark to Luke. And you know, learn a little more about the human side of Jesus. And go to Matthew. Understand the, the, the Jewish context of the Gospels. 
And then when you're ready for your minds to really be blown, then you can go on to John. But start with Jesus. And even if we've been followers for a long, long, long time, it wouldn't kill us to go back once in a while, would it? To revisit who Jesus is, to really get reacquainted with Jesus. And then the challenge, of course, is to, when we read the Gospels, to try and read them with fresh eyes. To not bring all of our prior understanding to bear on it, but to try and, and, and get reacquainted with Jesus again for the first time. That's, that's how the disciples learn. Right? The disciples learn by following Jesus around day in and day out. They were students of the teacher. And of course, the, the, the disciples of other rabbis would follow their rabbi around, and their ultimate goal was to try and emulate their rabbi, to try and do what their rabbi did, talk like their rabbi talked, and become just like their rabbi. That's, that's what the, the disciples were doing. Following Jesus day after day after day. They watched the way he interacted with others. They understood the way he interacted with them. And they were just trying to absorb as much of him as they could. And that's, that's what we do. You know, we, we may not be able to literally follow a person around day after day after day after day like the disciples were, but we we do have Jesus to follow. We can still be immersed in Jesus by absorbing the Gospels and reading them day after day after day, and we do in fact have the Holy Spirit to illuminate our understanding to help us comprehend what we might not be able to comprehend otherwise. That's, that's what we have to be about. We have to be about absorbing Jesus into our minds and into our hearts. That we might begin to think like Jesus. That we might begin to act like Jesus. That we might, that we might become what God created us to become. And I, I guess it doesn't need to be said, maybe it's a good way to wrap up by, by reminding ourselves that ultimately it doesn't matter how clearly we see the world, ultimately it doesn't matter how, how much we know about Jesus if we, if we then take off the new self and put the old self back on. I, I, uh, I was reading a story about the Emperor Constantine. Now, Christianity was outlawed until the Roman Emperor Constantine had this vision at night of Jesus and he felt like he had to follow Jesus because it would be good for him in the long run. He, he had his entire army baptized. They started on one side of a river and marched through to the other side. They, they, were, they were all baptized in a single day. At least that's what the legend said. With one very important exception, as they marched through this river and were baptized, they held their sword hand high above the water. Why? Well, that way, there wouldn't be any problem with them killing the enemy the next day. Right? All the rest of me was baptized, but I don't want the actual business part to be baptized. <laughs> That way we can just go on killing with, without really any any, any, uh, any damage to our conscience there. And in a way, and you have to work with me a little bit on this, I know for a fact that in my heart there are moments, there are times when I have taken off the old self and put the new self back on, but I don't, I don't want to throw away the old self entirely because once in a while I feel good just to try it on again. <laughs> And, you know, I'll put on the old self and kind of do what I want to do for a while. And, okay, now it's, you know, it's Saturday. I should really take the old self back off again, put the new self back on in time for Sunday. There's a reason why Paul uses the imagery of death when he's describing 
are becoming followers of Jesus. You have died to sin. Don't go on living in it anymore. It's because death is pretty permanent. The last thing Paul would have intended was for people to think that they can put on Christ when it's convenient and take off Christ when it's inconvenient to be a follower. You don't, Paul says, just get to hop back and forth from one to the other. You have been raised from death to life, and you should not go back living in the former way of life that leads nowhere. I, mean, I, I think Paul would see it so very clearly. Now, it would be as if we went from living in, in a pig pen full of, well, stuff that you would find in a pig pen and suddenly got invited to come live in a penthouse. Paul would say, why in the world if you had been raised from the pig pen to the penthouse, why in the world would you go back to it? What is there in the pig pen that you could possibly want to go back to? He says, why in the world if you've been raised from death to life would you ever want to go back? Why in the world, now that you've taken off the old self and it's darkened the understanding, why in the world, now that you can see the world as it really is. Why in the world would you want to go back to fumbling around in the dark? Why in the world would you concede that you've been investing in something that is empty and meaningless? And you've been given the opportunity to invest in something that is eternal, that lasts forever. Why in the world would you want to go back and waste your time on something that's fake Artificial. Phony. <clears throat> it doesn't matter how much we know. It doesn't matter how clearly we can see. If we don't take the old self off and leave it off, we will never be all that God created us to be. We will never be what we truly are meant to be if we don't take it off and leave it behind. Yeah. Maybe, it, maybe it calls to us once in a while. Maybe it calls to us. Ah, I feel good. I feel comfortable. Just, just for a few minutes. Just put me back on for a few minutes. <laughs> Put off the selfishness and put on the selflessness. Put off the greed to put on the generosity of Christ. Put off the world and all that goes with the artificial <coughs> nature of the world. The sparkly things of the world. To put on the truth that is in Jesus. We have to die daily to the former way of thinking. Truly embrace, truly embrace the, the, the life, the, the wholeness, the fullness of life that truly is found in Jesus. Amen. 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 Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we pray for clarity. Clarity of thought. Father, there's so much about the world we live in that's so enticing. And Father, we don't mean to, to, to demonize anything or anyone. But Father, we can look around us with clarity and see that, that there are choices we have before us every day. 
things we know that are ultimately good for us that will draw us closer to you and into deeper relationship and understanding of you and things that are wasteful. Father, we pray that you would help us to see clearly the choices we have daily. Help us to understand those choices. And help us to choose those things which give life. Not just life for ourselves, but help us to make choices that that give life to others as well. Father, when we are tempted to put down others, help us instead to build them up. When we're tempted to discourage, teach us to encourage. Father, we just thank you so much for your Holy Spirit which lives in us. We pray that you would give us greater sensitivity to your Spirit's leading and your Spirit's pull on our lives. Give us clarity of thought and give us, Lord, a greater desire to follow you and listen to you. We just thank you so much for your presence in our lives. Just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> if you're here uh, this morning and not a member of Day Spring Fellowship, uh, we'd love for you to become a member of Day Spring Fellowship. You can come and join uh, people here who are just striving every day to, uh, to do better. Striving every day to be better than we were the day before. We'd, we'd love for you to be a part of that. Um, if you're here this morning and uh, you're really not sure exactly where you are in your relationship with God, uh, we'd love to talk with you about that. Um, we'd love for you to come and uh, you know, talk with Ray or Alan, myself, uh, Corey or Lori. Um, uh, is that all right? <laughs> Uh, we'd love for you to come and find us some topics. We'd love to hear your story and answer any questions you might have. Again, if you're here this morning and you'd like to become a part of Day Spring Fellowship, uh, we invite you to come forward as we sing our next song. Let's stand.